Okay, All right. Okay, this is our first official ramble, I think. Yeah, this uh, is. Other than the other more structured, organized um, lectures, rambles. presentations. Yeah. yeah, no, we ramble pretty much, I think, ever since I met you. Uh, you and I have rambled. Rambled on and on. Oh, how we've rambled. But today it's going to be a little bit more focused ramble, sort of. Like, I need my notes over here, too. Excuse okay, you got notes. Yeah, I've yeah, got you some got notes, and I got a PowerPoint. I've got notes. We're because, like, um, yeah, because I've got uh, I've got some things that I, you know, in, my, in a PowerPoint too. I don't know if we can get it up at the same time, but but let's go through your ramble. I mean, not your PowerPoint. Yeah, here, and then and, and then and we can both jump in because I picked out a few images. I think one of which is similar to yours. Okay. And uh, and you made notes. Yeah. And, so let me just explain what we're doing, which is um, we decided to sort of talk about what makes a good image to our uh, 160 class by showing you good images. Um, and the way that Calvin and I thought we would do that is kind of show them and talk about them as they come up. So make it just sort of a more casual um, conversation. Anybody who happens to be hanging out, like you, Maggie, can pi uh, chime in anytime with a question and or a comment. Let's get rid of my four yeah, mailing palette. Let me say it, but we need that. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I can, I can, you know, I was, you know, watching your, um, can I jump in here? Is yeah, there's just one of the other thing I want to say by way of introduction is that we're um, incorporating some of the images that you all took. This is to the summer 160 class, summer 2014. We are incorporating some of the pictures that you took and sort of jumping off from that onto, to, in order to talk about what makes a good image. I also want to, I want to incorporate not just the formal design elements and principles, but we're interested in starting to talk about meaning and how meaning happens and how we interpret imagery. Yeah, and if you saw uh, Nell's uh, uh, lecture, it's about a 40 minute lecture on uh, the elements of design, you would get a, be a good background for this particular one. So if you haven't seen it, go ahead and see it. But one thing that Nell said during the whole thing is, uh, during that elements of design lecture that stuck with me and that I think is relevant to this particular ramble is um, as far as what makes a good image is what makes us want to stay with it why do you want to keep looking at this image and I think that's that's, that's a hard. great question yeah and it's a really good question because we have we have so many images where we see them every day why would you particularly want to stay on one particular image uh, that's a really nice point and, what, what makes you stay with an image and uh, what is that something within your power? What sort of elements and principles do you use to manipulate the viewer into sort of seducing them into the image? And how do you combine that with content or what the subject of the image is to make the uh, make the image worthwhile? Correct. And and this particular slide, I think goes is, is right with that. I like it. I hate it. Meh. Can take it one way or the other. Uh, I'd like to go back just to that first statement since we're just rambling and kind of riffing off things is that. I, uh, no, I mean the next one. I mean the the, the I like and I hate it is. Uh, I had a, a a colleague tell me one time not when I said well, she asked me what did I thought about an image. I said well I like it. She goes don't ever say I like it. Don't ever use the word like mm -hmm. because it doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. unless you unless you follow it with I like it because mm -hmm. it has strong design elements. Mm -hmm. It has really nice shapes or values or whatever. So that particular word I would caution viewers to stay away from. Oh, I like it. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why I created this slide, because if you like it, so what? Who cares about what you like? I mean, you care. But whether you like it or not doesn't necessarily make an image successful, right? An image may, you might hate an image, and yet it's super successful. It might be successful because it makes you hate it. Um, so the way to look at imagery is to get rid of that kind of judgment. You know, I like it or I hate it. It really doesn't matter. And instead, look and deconstruct the image to see what's going on in this image. How, how is the structure working? How is the content working? What's going on to um, make, make this do whatever it is? What are, what are its unifying principles? And what is its overall oomph? What, what's the message? What's the, what's the chutzpah of the image? Use some visual thinking. Yeah, use sort some of, visual I don't know, just to throw out a couple of words there. People say I like it all the time, and, and that's a fine way to sort of introduce what you're going to talk about. But I think just what Calvin just said, you know, um, you can like it, okay, and, you know, what does that have to do with me? So you can like red, and I can like blue, and red and blue, you know, 
They don't really live in a hierarchical situation. Red is really good for some reasons and blue is really good for other reasons. So again, the I like it, I hate it doesn't matter. What matters is what's the, what's its value. Good? Good. Okay. So, so here we have an image here. This, this is Laura's, right? Yeah, this is Laura's. This is one of Laura's um, images from the Where Am I project. And it's striking. I mean, this is an image that you could uh, you could abstract this. You could make this whole thing out of, let's say, cut paper. Take it, take away the fact that it's a hammock and a pool and a walkway and a fence and a ball, right? And make it abstract. So just make it out of cut paper um, so that you can't recognize what those things are. You can't name them. And you'll see super strong composition, really dynamic um, playfulness with what's going on with line and shape. This, the unifying concept here is all about shape. It's a really beautiful image. Um, there's a lot of tension. Um, uh, you know, here's a nice clear shape. Then there's these lines that create a rhythmic pattern. Um, they, they remember, lines are like arrows. So they point us in this direction. They divide the, they divide the image. There's this beautiful pink ball. Who could ever go wrong with a little centered pink perfectly point, right in there. Well, centered within this portion of the image, not centered in the image at all. It's a very um, dynamic image. There's nothing static about it, right? Remember, static means horizontal and vertical. Those are the places where we really kind of sit still. Nothing sits still in this image. Um, there's a lovely loop, loopy thing going mm -hmm. yeah, on here. Yeah, I like that yeah. line there, that curved line. It's, just, it's very... really a lovely way to see a very... Um, mundane maybe it's actually it's not a very mundane backyard but it is a commonplace um these are commonplace items you wouldn't think that a pool could and a hammock could be exciting visually they're certainly exciting physically <laughs> but mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. this there's a visual dynamism going on here that i think is really exciting and i, I chose um a, an artist to talk about to sort of couple um that image with to talk about how you can take something like a pool and basically make a career out of it. <laughs> um, this artist is David Hockney, and he uh, he's a British artist. I think he lives in California or lived a portion of his life in California. He's still living. Um, but he was very much into pools. He explored pools um, visually for many, many years and still does. Um, so these works, this one is a, um, which, which one should I see? That'll work. This is a painting. An acrylic painting. This is a photo montage. Um, I will upload these, or I think I already have uploaded this um, PowerPoint so that you can link to these images or find out about more about these artists. <clears throat> and here's another image by the same artist, David Hockney, where he takes Polaroids and puts them together. So this really does exactly what, what Laura was doing. It takes a mundane um, image, a pool, Again, this pool is a little bit not mundane because it's his pool and he drew those squiggles. He painted those squiggles on the actual surface of the pool. So it's, it's already a little bit interesting. But even if he hadn't done that, I mean, that really activates the page. But he would activate the page anyway by his process here, which is simply to take a picture of pictures of a pool. These are Polaroids. This is a Polaroid um, collage. Um, and then so he's kind of framing from his point of view multiple shots from the very same place or from various places. You can actually see this looks like a topical view, but this is from the side to recreate a very simple, you know, oblong shape within a rectangle. Um, but it, it remains intricate. So this is one of those images mm -hmm. that I think is an example of it. You stay with it. You stay with it. And I think, well, this, this particular image goes, uh, something I had written down that I, that I, what I like uh, about photography is being able to take something that's mundane and then represent it as something else. And a, a pool, fairly mundane object in, in our life, most people are familiar with swimming pools, and yet with all these lines, the way he shot it, up from above, and he's not that concerned either. If you look at the sides of the pool, he's not that concerned with matching well, things up. Yeah, this, It's this, just the overall effect. And this is your uh, implied line. Like we, our eyeball just makes this nice organizational swoop. We don't care that that lines up or not. In fact, it's much more interesting that it does not, right? It adds kind of a dynamism to that predictable nature of a, of, of, a, of a shape. Maggie, can you see these images okay? Okay. Okay. So the other thing I want to say is um, uh, I think I want just to go off on the ramble a little bit. Um, I think every artist in every image is trying to sort of represent 
what's already known. Represent the mundane, represent to you so that you can see anew the thing that you already know. That's, that's it. There's, there's no big whoop about um, art. It's really just how do, you, how do you represent what we already know so that we see afresh. And I think what that seeing afresh is the artist's job to, to, to make exciting this, to make exciting and perhaps create possibility um, where we see routine. So this breaks the routine, and it's exciting. I mean, it is physiologically exciting to look at that image. I think he's doing things like that now with, with video. Oh, cool. I know I've, seen, I've seen projects he's done where he has like 10 video cameras all cool. on this little grid, and then oh, he just yeah. goes down a road, and he just, you know, and so everyone's shooting very similar, very close, but they each on, are, are a distinct little block, and it's on the little, oh, there goes my Super Bowl. Don't want to lose my Super Bowl right here. So Hockney... Video. See, I'm writing that down because I'm going to look that up. That interests me. And Nam Jun Pak is another person to look up for video. And a lot of, you'll see a lot of photographers. How do you spell really, Nam Jun Pak? I'll, I'll write it down. I don't actually remember. Um, his last name is P A I K. His first name is N A M, and I think it's J U N, but I'm not sure. Um, but a lot of people are working with video now. Almost all artists are working with video in some form or another, um, just because it is so accessible. And I'm actually going to show you some links to that too. So, um, you know, what is what is video except moving photography? Why? I would say that's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's like you're taking images and moving them. Yeah, it's like you're taking images and putting them in sequence. <laughs> Very close to that. So I thought this this I chose this one from Melissa. You know, you could. Jump in anytime with anything that you yeah. want to pull up. So if you find like it's yeah, well I've got a, well I've got a little PowerPoint. I, I did since you sent yours. I put a few things together and we can look at it afterwards because it got some. Uh, it's got other images by okay. the students as well. Okay, so. cool, good. And this is one I liked of hers as well. Yeah. I think she one of the first ones she yeah. took and uh, it immediately jumped out because she had it first just shot it normally from right. the front and then decided to shoot it from above and just kind of isolated all those other at the legs etc. So it leaves a little bit of mystery about what the object is. Yeah, I like how you say that because I think that's exactly the strength of this image. So this is her chair, right? It's not actually a chair; it's a stool. Yeah, she said she called it my chair, but um, uh, and and you you wouldn't know that from this angle. You would have no idea that this was even a dimensional object necessarily. It could be a sphere. It could be completely flat. It could be a button. It could be a world. I mean, you have no idea of scale. You have no idea of of function. Um, it's, it's abstract, it, 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 the title is actually what grounds it. It says my chair, and then you start to understand, wow, it's a chair, well how can that be a chair? Um, and you start to interpret, your brain makes sense of this. Um, I think that the texture qualities in here are gorgeous, and I, I think they're, they may be unintentional, I don't know. <laughs> but it's also what makes you want to keep looking at it, you know, there's something yep. about that texture, that smoothness, that reflectivity of it. That really kind of draws yeah. you in. So you get a subtle textural um, going on on the surface of the stool itself with this lovely kind of outer rim that creates an outline, right? The shadow where that, I assume that's where the depth of the stool top is. But then the modeled nature of this guy, absolutely lovely. Um, and I think that the modeling here and the modeling here, you know, they provide a contrast in color, but they don't really provide a contrast in terms of like, uh, I would say overall tonality. They're different tones, but like the sort of, what do I want to say, like the, the heaviness, the weight of the texture mm -hmm. is similar in both. The other thing I like, and I'm fairly certain this is uh, unintentional, is the fact that it's not centered. It's really just off it's center. It's just off, yes, more to the left than it is anything. Which adds dynamism, right? Because if, it were, if yeah. it were centered, we would think, okay, that's centered, that's the way it's supposed to be. Instead, it, it's got some action to it, right? So there's an yeah. asymmetric that balance going on. Yeah, and you had a good part of that in your lecture, too, where you talked about asymmetry. Right. You know, what, what that creates in the viewer. Right. You know, for, for the sense of impending something happening, right. something moving toward another place, et cetera. Right. And that, that happens in photography. People talk about that in terms of, uh, just in the simple basic photography one when you're shooting let's say a silhouette of someone they're looking into the larger part of the frame you don't normally take somebody's picture and put it all the way up against the right side of the frame right. unless you want to create that disquiet which right. is fine but normally you leave a little bit room in front and creates a little more asymmetry and also we could talk about positive negative space here 
you know, and, um, you know, what is positive and what is negative? Or what is occupied and what is on unoccupied space? Does that exist? The, the frame, how you frame what size this actually is, uh, super important. Those are decisions that the artist makes. And, you know, we squeeze in here. We have a little bit more space here. So our eye kind of travels around this in a comfortable, exciting kind of adventure. Okay. <laughs> so um, a million people work with circles. So I didn't really even know where to go with, with, um, with Melissa's work. But I went here. <laughs> My, my yeah. first call was for Bridget Riley's, who 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 um, worked in the gosh, I think sixties and seventies, and I will look that up and add that to the PowerPoint exactly what what this is and um, when it was done. But she she was part of a movement that was an op art movement, op standing for optical, and uh, you can see how much if you talk about positive and negative, if you talk about scale change, how much movement there is in this work. This is a drawing or it might be a painting, but it's a, um, it, this is a flat work. But when I talk about one of the elements being illusion no of space, space yeah, that's... that's it, right? Look how that thing moves. I mean, it really has a sense of it being conical. But the other thing that really moves is the, the contrast between the black and the white strips. They cause your eye to, to vibrate, right? You're going back and forth, back and forth with each of those little things. It's a supremely active piece. Although it has a quietude about it, it's simply a circle. And it just saved itself. Wow. Saved itself. Yeah, 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 see, it had to save itself because. Okay, who we have next here? Okay, so the next one I've got is I pulled. The, I really. Wow. Did you pull this one? No, no, you didn't. That's yours right there. I did another one of Maggie's on my slide. Yeah, good, good. Oh, I pulled out. I, Maggie, I pulled out this image because I thought. Um, there's just something really disquieting about it. I mean, I think you may have meant it sort of serenely. I don't know. Did you? No, no, yeah, no answer. I think she oh, muted no. herself. Yeah. <laughs> or did I mute? Did you? Yeah, I'm muted. Okay. Oh. Um, that, no, that's probably, I, I was just going to, um, you, you, you can mute yourself. That's probably a good idea. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> But um, I, I pulled this out because it's odd in terms of its coloration, right? So you, you look at this, and I look at this, and I think in terms of the subject matter, here's a place where the formal elements and I think the subject matter are um, having a nice, an interesting conversation. So I know this is a picture of a, um, you know, a, a bedroom, a comfortable, kind of sweet bedroom, the bed's made, there's pillows, they're fluffed, you know, there's a nice um, image on the wall, there's this lovely light, everything about it has a sense of warmth to me in terms of my connotations of the objects. But the coloration is kind of this green... Um, the green cast of... Um, it, it's puny. Well, 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 one of the things that I think gives a little bit of a disquiet too is that corner. The light mm -hmm. sitting on the corner and that little triangle right above it—it mm -hmm. it makes it a little off kilter. So that kind of throw that kind of gives a little dynamism between the quietude of the mm -hmm. subject and 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 the performance of the image. Oh, I like the way you said performance of the image because I think that's what starts to happen here. Something is starting to happen now. There's a couple of things that feel un that I'd like to see actually uh, uh, pushed, and one is I'd like to see more of that corner. I'd like to see that coming down farther, and I'd like to get rid of that, because I think that thing, that reflection, um, is a big focal point um, that doesn't help the cause. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so this image, strange color, creates kind of a disquiet to me, and that reminded me of a fellow who, uh, oh, yeah. who's named yeah Gregory Crudson, who sets up tableaus and photographs them, and just has just this eeriness about him. Now, typically his work will have figures in it, but he does do a lot of work that, that doesn't. And um, you can just kind of see there's just there's a creepy quality here. I know all these these items, they're very familiar. He works with the suburbs and he kind of talks about how the suburbs have a um, kind of an antiseptic quality to them and um, otherworldly. Um, so I just put a couple of images. And he lights them in an otherworldly place. I mean, the, the, his, his street scenes with the lights. I mean, the, he goes to a really elaborate uh, detail to produce these. I mean, they're like a movie set when he brings them. There's like 
must be 20 people out there on the set setting these up, lighting it like such as this one, the light inside the shed, a little bit of light on that fence on the out, on both fences on the outside, and just that little squirt of light on the grass in front of her. And she looks suspended, sort of. In the yeah, they don't look real. They, yeah. look, they just don't but look real. It's either hyper real. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyways, you know, little, little images can, you know, you add an idea and you add a lot of thought to how you craft them can become just completely a big worlds. And one of the things that this makes me think of, I, one of the things I was thinking about what, what makes a good images and, and the extremes is one that has a lot of mystery. It's very mysterious or one that's so blatant and so obvious that it just draws you in with its sheer blatancy. And this one kind of crosses over into those two. Yeah. It's mysterious and blatant. We know exactly what it is. It's a backyard, some house in suburbia, yet there's something suspenseful and mysterious about this thing as well. So, yeah. I think that's a really good point. I think that, that a good image tells a story, and the story might not necessarily be a narrative. It could be an abstract story. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to mix with the craft, right? So his, like you're saying, how much time he spends on crafting this. Look at that beautiful blue in the middle there. Yeah, you know, next true, to the yeah. shape of the green, next to the shape of the light coming out of the dented shed, um, and the, the, the repetition of the the triangle here and the triangle here. I mean, this really holds together. If you, Again, if you were to take this and turn it into cut paper or turn it into an abstract yeah. composition by taking away its subjectivity, you would still get a really uh, carefully crafted, um, formally considered image. Yeah, that makes me think of what you were talking about in the in the video on the elements of design about shape and you were uh, there was a Robert Frank photograph of a car yeah like cut in half and just kind of tilted to the side yeah. but the shapes were very obvious within it and there was a narrative going on yeah. within that car but you you were first drawn in by yeah. the shapes you know because the round headlight yeah. the roundness of the vehicle and the windshield and then inside there was a I think a person in a the person was so a small furry thing you I made the person that, up nest you yeah. know so it wasn't didn't you just assumed that yeah yeah, I almost feel like the formal elements are there to seduce you into staying with the image so that you can just kind of, you want to be there and, make, and your mind wants to uh, make make it up, make mm -hmm. make up the story, be be involved with it, be engaged yeah. with it. How can it relate to me? that's what story I like to make up, too. I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah. She's obviously from outer... No, I'm just <laughs> Okay, so then, um, let's see, this is from Anna's. And Anna had, actually, Anna had a couple of pieces uh, that I was interested in. One was her chair. I, think I her liked chair. her chair. It's funny that you brought this one up because I, I completely overlooked this one. Uh -huh. But seeing it here, I can see why you picked it uh -huh. out with the lines here in the foreground and then the line in the background, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, well, I like that we chose different ones. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Um, yeah, so I just think the shapiness of this, the simplicity of, you know, the division. Here's one shape, one. Here's another shape, two. Here's another shape, three. So it's sort of the, the story of thirds. And I think it's another example we could, uh, when you were talking about some of the things Maggie could do with her photograph, it yeah. with Anna could do uh, something similar, or not the same things, but by taking it into Photoshop, enhancing some of them, you know, by maybe changing the contrast a bit, darkening Absolutely. the sky, Absolutely. et cetera, and that line in the front becomes even more powerful, and the yeah. line in the background becomes more powerful. Right, because what happens here is you get kind of a sense of maybe, you know, sort of a developing sense of, oh, I'm dividing this into shapes. But if you really start to work with that, um, if I look at this image, you know, really this right here, this dark bush, that's the strongest, the darkest, and the most contrasty piece in the image, and it's the least interesting, right? Um, what I want is for this whole thing to read as a piece. So this might want to lighten up, mm -hmm. or this might want to somehow incorporate that this could really become a brilliant something or other color, you know, yeah, this more, and these more guys. More shimmery and... Uh, uh -huh. But even and that this, bush, it, even though it could, and you could change it in the fact that it's more contrast, mm -hmm. it still has that sort of darkness to it, but the leaves pop out a little bit more. Sure, or this whole piece becomes dark and contrasty. Yes, yes. So there's a lot you could do once you start to sort of get a hold of what you want to, do, how you want to formally organize this image, how can you push that? Well, sometimes when you're taking the photograph, you don't see some of the things that actually work well, too, like under the banister, underneath the banister, the lightness under there, that's a nice line in and of itself, mm -hmm. and the line that, you know, that goes along the shadow. And I think the repetition of these things with these things, you know, I'm going to pull that together. They're both sort of bridges. And here again, those things. Blue, blue, yeah. Some, nice, some, some really nice things going on in there that could be pushed. 
Okay, this, these just reminded me of a couple of painters that I thought would be nice to sort of um, pull in. Painters are doing the same thing that a photographer's doing, just thinking about how light falls, thinking about how directional line works, thinking about composition, shape, etc. All the things that we've been talking about. Um, so this is Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, he, Richard Diebenkorn, another California artist, um, all, very much about shape. You can kind of see that here. Oh. Just a, oh, he's just such a delicious painter. Definitely look him up. Matisse, you've probably a heard of. Too. Deep in corn. Deep in corn. Who can argue Who with Who can it? argue yeah, with deep in corn? corn yes. <laughs> he he does a lot of San Francisco streets where the where the streets are just like vertical, and that's because they're so steep. And he's interpreting that. It's really lovely. Um, and Matisse lives in the same place that Anna does. That's amazing that they share that. <laughs> Yeah, he's in the and Matisse is in the apartment next door to Anna, so I thought I'd throw that in. To the left of Anna, yeah. look in the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> Across the ocean. I'm sorry, I interrupted. That. No, just just another another artist who's working with shape, and um, these are all looking out the veranda, just like Anna's was. So they sort of reminded me of that. Uh, Carlisa. Oh goodness. Okay, it's not Carlisa. It's Carlisa. I told her I'd fix it. Look, I did. <laughs> You did. Right I've there. got the power. Okay, so Carlisa sent this picture in of her um, kitchen, a portion of her kitchen, uh, which immediately brought to mind for me, and this is going to be all about message, um, a couple of very important pieces that happened in the 70s. Um, one is, do you know Martha Rossler? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Martha, she also did some paintings of like the like soldiers in her living room collages yeah collages. yeah they're photo they're photo montages mm -hmm. they're fantastic and that would be actually a really good that would really actually be a really good project for us to assign mm -hmm. get some soldiers in our arms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she did two well martha rossler is a really interesting artist maybe i'll do a little thing yeah. on her yeah she's well worth she that just, yeah but this piece is called semiotics of the kitchen um and this is one of the videos i was referring to earlier and what happens in this in this um video is <laughs> uh, this is also worth um um linking to is she it's kind of a discussion without any actual discussion about a women's a woman's place being in the home and she sort of takes the knife and she it's a performance and she does she goes super violent with it and not not in a stupid way but in a really um powerful way so she's worth looking at and that came from thinking about um kitchen thinking about place and thinking about who she is identity so um all that ideas about about the kitchen martha rossler look at her um, another piece in 1972 was is a piece called Woman House, and this was Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro in um, Southern California led a graduate student class where um, this was this was this sort of was at the peak of the women's movement or the you know very strong artist piece um, where they had a bunch of women in graduate school and they took over a house that was going to be demolished and they developed each room to sort of think about the same issues of place, identity, um, social kind of norms and thoughts and misogyny. Uh, and they did performance and poetry and as well as transforming um, and installing pieces in the, in, the, in, the, in the space itself. So this kitchen is, I think it was painted, I actually can't remember whether it's yellow or pink. And then these um, things on the wall, they're eggs and the eggs become breasts. Every, everything sort of just is, is reminding you of ideas about being a woman and having identity. We have this movie, the Woman House documentary, in our library. It is a super powerful piece of primary source material. So everyone who goes to this college should see it. <laughs> um, it's, it's dated. It feels like 1972, but it's really super, super important and super good. Okay, well, um, I'll take this here. one right here. This yeah. one, I think, really yeah. is a, yeah. a PowerPoint. And yeah, this it, is the uh, PowerPoint. That's where you click to add the title. This is where you click to add the title, and then, of course, you've got your, your Te text, text here. Yeah, right. And I so. think this probably is one of the more powerful contemporary yeah. images we've ever seen. Yeah, well, you know, it really evokes a lot of, you know, shape. Um, shape. It talks about sort of identity, again, you know, and... <laughs> Or lack thereof. <laughs> yeah, which is one and the same, I think. Yeah, so I'm going to move on now. Yeah, to... I was kind of <laughs> drifting off there for a moment. Okay. Um, Rafa. 
<laughs> okay, so yeah, I like that photograph. This is one of Rafa's pieces, and it's I think it's he's telling us about you know sort of his place. Uh, I can't remember now if this is his office or his home, but this is one of the things that that he, I think it's his office, and he mentioned in the terms that he likes a very neat, more spare desk. Yeah. Um. So that little monkey guy reminds me of an artist named Mike Kelly who does some really powerful work with stuffed animals, um, uh, security blankets, um, things from childhood. Uh, and the more you study uh, Mike Kelly, the more complicated and really twisted this man becomes. And uh, what he's dealing with are actually concepts of uh, um, childhood sexual abuse. So they're seemingly lighthearted and fun and actually they are they can be really funny um, and then they can also be really powerful uh, I just saw a, pr a retrospective of his at PS1 in New York um, it's, it's really some very hard to watch but really powerful work um, and then when you deal with scale <laughs> you can take um, puppy and make him gigantic and a whole nother thing happens. So this is Jeff Koons. This is a topiary. So this is in Bilbao and, and he has planted this this puppy, this puppy shape and um, made it this cute little tiny tchotchka just monumental and a monument. And it just changes your whole perception of how we think about what we make and what we um, sort of, I don't know, personify and what we can do and it's just the kind of art that really um, creates questions, and I think that's interesting. Is that on the top of a building or down in a... No, no, it's in a plaza. Plaza? Yeah. Okay. I've seen some of his on top of buildings. And they're yeah, yeah, shiny. yeah. So look up Jeff Koons. He does some crazy stuff. You probably recognize some of the stuff. He's a crazy, he, he crazy guy, He can see some crazy stuff, and other people make them, That's right. right. He's, that's right. He's he, that he kind of guy. Right. No, he, yeah. He's the idea man. Actually, he really is an idea man. He's an interesting fellow. He's really made a career out of... Um, exploiting, I think, exploiting the art world. He makes oh, yeah, that he man makes it. a lot of money. He does make a lot of money. Yeah. That thing there probably costs a 50, 60 bucks. Um, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. All right. So what I want to do is switch to yours, I guess. But Can we're we going to have that? to do that with the. I think we got to do, do it this. With, I think we have to do it with the screen share, and what then it'll just it'll find that on the screen. What if I do this? I just switch them into mine. You know what I mean? Can you do that? I can. That's crazy. There's some crazy stuff. This is stuff something about PowerPoint I never knew existed. Holy cow. Get out of here. I know. Let's so just lower that one so that you can do what you want with that. Man, that's real. Oh, I didn't want to do that, did I? I think you want to go back to the normal the view you had Where is that? which is just the, that? Uh, the, the edit view. Yeah. Okay. Except you have to click to add title. I didn't take those out. Yeah, we can do it right now. Who would have known? Yeah, we didn't know we were going to do it like this. Okay. So, yeah, so this is Keras right here. Somewhere there. Yeah, sorry. And it was an airport. And it actually reminded me of, um, you know, it, it went so many different ways. Remember the olive cotton um, photograph of the, sh the cups? And the sh but that was more. Yeah, that was in our. That was a little bit more about shape and symmetry, et cetera. Mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. reminded me a little bit more of, of Cortez's. Um, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, his chairs, which are next, if you could click on those. Oh. And they really, I think the shadows create a, a, a sort of drama in them that, at, at any other time of day, would not have Beautiful. happened. Yeah. So it really highlights the lines and shapes of, uh, and uh, value of the things. Yeah, and this is sort of artist's eye. I mean, what a beautiful thing to see. And once you start to become attuned to seeing that kind of beauty in, in, in the mundane, you see it everywhere. Um, but, you know, these look like drawings, these little shadows. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. like these beautiful Lyrical little drawings. line drawings. Yeah. And then the rhythm, the rhythm of the lines and the rhythm of the seats and the rhythm of the actual and the integration of those things and the way that photograph is divided into those threes, etc. He had fun with those because he has he has many photographs of chairs and that time of day, which is a good time of day, by the way, for everybody out there looking, is uh, is that 
beginning of the day or the end of the day when the, the shadows, shadows are, are more when the shadows yeah. are long and the lights more dramatic you know in movie making it's called you know the magic hours where yeah. people you know you get really that really nice quality of light but what i like about it is the shadows it creates because it just changes everything yeah it changes everything and um the idea like when you shoot in really brilliant light things wash out um they're just hard to they're harder to see unless that's what you want but it's a harsher light I love to photograph when they're, when it's raining, when it's stormy, you know, when things are oh, gray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just get such mm -hmm. vivid, beautiful colors. Uh, this is um, Melissa's photograph of her flash. That, you know, she bought that camera. Oh, isn't that, that interesting? That, view, that, that uh, uh, two and a quarter square type uh -huh, camera, this uh -huh. is 620 film, and got really close to it. And I love the shape of it. I like the reflectivity of it. I like the, it had sort of a, I had a little emotional response to uh, that feeling and texture and shape that it took. And, and it looks like she's doing some similar things yeah, with, I'm the, interested with, with the circle. That she's, that they're so similar. Um, where are we? Come down. Oh, there he is, nice. So when you, when one, starts to do things that are uh, similar, one might notice that because what's going to happen, what, what happens here to me is this seems to be something she's interested in. Yeah, that shape, it draws her in and, and it, it, she may not even be aware of it. We weren't even aware of it until we put those two together, yeah. but there's something instinctual that you go by when you're shooting and yeah. I think that's it. And, and uh, another thing I like what she's done in this and it, even though the, the photograph I chose to accompany it uh, by Edward Weston is, is dissimilar in shape, is the proximity of what she got to her subject. She got close. You know, she's right above that chair, not very far away, really close to that light bulb. And this one by Weston, which I think is a little bit different than he normally does, but he got really close to this thing and it made it more abstract. Just like her, when you first look at that light bulb, you don't immediately recognize it for what it is. Right. Uh, and, it, and, and, and it takes up about the same amount of space as this particular right. uh, jagged glass does. And it yeah, has, it has it, the same similar emotional response to it. And I want to talk a little bit about the abstraction of that because what happens here, and I think also in, in Melissa's, is you, we, um, we're very familiar with these things. Mm -hmm. But by taking them at that, at that close of a range, we're not exactly sure what they are. So it sets up again this kind of dissonance and uh, conversation between our heads and our bodies, you know, our perception. We perceive this as something we know very well. I know those are trees, but I don't see them that way. I know it's some kind of reflection. It might be a window. I don't know if I'm looking at it through or if I'm looking at it reflected. What's with the crack? Where am I? Where is the ground? You know, because there's yeah, some I kind like of that. a strange. Where is the ground? That... Yeah. You don't know where you are in relation to that photograph. So it creates what you're talking about, that mystery. It mm -hmm. keeps us here. It keeps us. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I don't know why. Very yeah, simple. Does. Really simple. Um, also the texture, you know, the, what's going on here is this scratched up something that adds another layer to it. It adds another kind of uh, veneer. Mm -hmm. And that line on the bottom right corner also to me has texture, even though it's really a similar line. I know maybe it's because I'm thinking of glass and edges and that sort of thing. But has a yeah. feel to it. Yeah, me? I think these negative spaces, these shapes, are really important for this piece. The squareness mm -hmm. of this and the non-symmetry of this, the okay. non-obviousness of, mm -hmm. of what's being shot and that the very, um, you know, very straightforward way of framing it, I think are having a conversation. Those two pieces of glass are having a conversation. Uh-huh, it's a relationship. All... There's all kinds of relationships. I think we could write about this piece. Yeah, and that goes, you know, yeah, yeah, you're you're also you're thinking uh, the elements of design about proximity of the squares that are really close together, and yet yeah. the ones that are the same number of squares but they're drifted apart. Yeah, you know, tell a different right. story. Right, these these guys these guys are in love, or maybe they're having a fight. Yeah, they could be dueling. They're definitely, definitely <clears throat> interested in each other. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about here is just that I think you know when I talked about the uh, texture, mm -hmm. and she does it again here. You know, it's clearly something that interests her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's something. Melissa, that's something for you to look at. Okay, so let's see. We are down here here? To, to click another out. one of Roth. Yeah, click that out of there. Delete that one. Thank you. Because it's really big. Yeah, and this one, I think I picked two disparate images, but it had similar feels to me in the, the vertical lines. It was that and the Eggleston. You know, if you switch to the next one, the one I think, uh, yeah. 
always remove the click to add title. Yeah, that's. I think that's that's uh, so, a great so, juxtaposition. So, so, so even though they're really totally different subject matters and and, and have different color qualities to them, uh, the the lines are very similar. One's dreamy and one's really sharp, blatant right on. But uh, again, it's the vertical nature of the curtains and in the background you see that tall building or smokestack or whatever it is. Yeah. Actually, they have similar colorations for the goldenish. You're right. You're right. And then mm -hmm. the, the blue and the blue inside, outside, inside. Good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From the inside looking out, from the outside looking in, and then the rhythm of the curtain lines. That that's something that would be nice to sort of write about and compare and contrast. Uh, let's see. This is another Edward Weston of Driftwood, and I I I, I juxtaposed it next to to Maggie's photograph of a chair seat and again it's getting that I liked it because it was close you get really close to your subject matter it starts taking on an abstraction you get le a, a, a well away from what it was as a matter of fact I was playing with it today in Photoshop and I was just selecting one slat and changing its contrast etc to see how it looked but it already has a lot of contrast yeah. it has great lines in it uh, great texture in it yeah. and uh, there's a lot of different things that, that could, could be done to it Although, just in and of itself, it, it works. Oh, I think that's great. And I think texture was what I would say number one about those pieces. I mean, sort of really, that's what these are about. And I think, oh, you know, what I, have you worked with Photoshop, Maggie? Yeah. Um, kind of, not for this kind of stuff. Okay. But I would do really close stuff. What we would do is, um, like, We'd take a picture of a particular thing on someone, and then we'd just, like, take a color from it, and the rest of it would be black and white. Okay. But I've never done anything on, like, something like this, like okay. boards or yeah, anything, I mean, like, that has a lot of texture. And, and I, think, I think on something like this, I would start off with something minimal, just by, you know, darkening it and making the contrast different, just to make it pop a little bit more. But uh, it has that already. I mean, the, the black lines themselves yeah. are, are an integral part of the photograph. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that can wrap up our ramble here. Yeah, yeah. I think that can wrap up our I ramble. Think we, do, um, do we have any questions from the audience? <laughs> I mean, one. I think one thing I can say about our ramble is uh, I think that was really helpful that you had two two artists uh, picking images. I think it was interesting mm -hmm. that we both chose different ones. Yeah, that was yeah. Real. very good. Uh, I think, matter of fact, I think we'd be worth it to do it again in another week or so. Yeah, also, I think it might be worth either. it to do it again. Yeah, we'll have another ramble. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess that's well, it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, good night. Yeah. It's kind of like Ebert, e e yeah. Ebert and Siskel type Siskel thing. Siskel and Ebert. Yeah, we give it a thumbs up. Yeah, two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Okay. Okay, Maggie, thanks for joining us in this ramble. And uh, we will see you... I'm on uh, Saturday. Yeah. Next week, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Unless, All right. You, unless you're going to the Vivian Meyer exhibit today, which uh, I think I'm going to go to. Yeah. I'm going to take a selfie. Oh, that's gonna be yours. Yeah, it'll be mine. All right. All right. All right. See you later. Bye. Goodbye. All right. Bye, y'all.